The history and significance of amusement parks and roller coasters in Canada isn't nearly as grand as it is in the United States. Comparing the countries, the USA has had roughly 2,800 roller coasters in its history, nearly 14 times more than Canada, as they've only had just shy of 200. However, that doesn't mean that Canada isn't significant to amusement history. La Ronde in Montreal, Galaxyland at the West Edmonton Mall, and PNE Playland in Vancouver have all played a large part in amusement history. But there is one more major park, one that's not only by far the largest in the country, but also one of the largest in the world. Let's take a dive back through the history of the one, the only, Canada's Wonderland. I'm standing at the edge now, it's about to go down, I'm gonna take it higher. In order to properly appreciate this park, let's take it back. Back to the very beginning. All the way back to 1972. The story doesn't actually start in Vaughan. It starts nearly 800 kilometers away in a small town just north of Cincinnati. Well, we're really excited. This is quite fantastic out here. I guess it's good on the pocketbook too, huh? Well, that was quite a savings, I'll have to admit that. What do you think, Mrs. Henson? It's beautiful. Very imaginative. Think your children enjoying it? Oh. No doubt. <laughs> Kings Island is where Wonderland's story really begins. This park opened its gates on April 29, 1972, and was instantly a massive success. Not only was it the revitalization of Cincinnati's old Coney Island, which had been destroyed in a flood during the 60s, but it debuted with one of the most significant roller coasters of all time. It instantly pushed the park to the top of the amusement world and was one of three roller coasters that began the coaster renaissance of the 1970s. Kings Island was built and operated by the Taft Broadcasting Company, and after Kings Island's opening, Taft wanted to expand and bring that success outside of just one park. The first of these was Kings Dominion, located in Doswell, Virginia. This park began its construction in 1972 and opened in 1975. However, this wasn't the only park Taft had their eyes on. After the oil crisis of 1973, they merged with the Carowinds Corporation and took over operation of their park, Carowinds, in both Charlotte, North Carolina and Fort Mills, South Carolina in 1975. Outside of this acquisition, another new project was also planned just as King's Dominion was breaking ground, and this time they were taking their amusement prowess internationally. A day at Canada's Wonderland is a day like no other. 30 hair-raising rides. Five live shows, over 20 performances daily. 25 restaurants, 18 international boutiques, 12 cartoon characters, 20 special attractions, 12 hours a day, every day, from only $10.95. Come for the day of your life today at Canada's Wonderland. Taft considered multiple locations in Ontario, including Niagara Falls and multiple areas around the Greater Toronto Area. However, the city of Vaughan was selected because of its closeness to both Toronto and the 400 series of highways that run across southern Ontario. Nowadays, it's hard to imagine Vaughan without Wonderland, however, back then, there was strong opposition to the park. Not only from residents of the area, but also from other tourist destinations in Toronto, such as the CNE, Royal Ontario Museum, and the now defunct Ontario Place. They believed that the Toronto tourism market wasn't large enough to support the new competition that Canada's Wonderland would give them. There were also worries about the noise that the park would produce. In turn to this opposition, a berm was constructed around the park, and oppositioning councillors of the area were flown to Mason to see the positive impact that Kings Island had on that community. Additionally, there were many worries of Americans building an amusement park in Canada. Many believed that it would be part of a cultural invasion of the country by the US. To counter these worries, Taft ensured the public that there would be an entire major area of the park designated and themed to Canadian history and culture. After the opposition was mostly settled and the go-ahead was granted, Canada's Wonderland began its construction on the 13th of June, 1979. The construction of Canada's Wonderland lasted for just under two years. 
During that time, the 320-acre plot began transforming into a stunning amusement park. Canada's Wonderland was unlike King's Island and King's Dominion, however, as their centerpiece would not be a replica Eiffel Tower. Instead, Canada's Wonderland was gifted an original icon, a massive steel mesh and concrete mountain, dubbed Wonder Mountain. After just two years of construction, it was finally time for Taft to make history. On the 23rd of May, 1981, the Premier of Ontario at the time, Bill Davis, and the President of Taft, Dudley S. Taft, opened Canada's Wonderland for the first time. The park's opening ceremony featured over 10,000 balloons, 13 parachutists, 350 white doves, and had an appearance by Wayne Gretzky, who helped to raise the Canadian flag at the park for the first time. Canada's Wonderland had now been welcomed by Ontario, and it would return the favor when Ontarians stepped into the park for the first time. The original Although Canada's Wonderland wouldn't have the same centerpiece as the other Taft parks, the entrance to the park would be very similar, even having the same name of International Street. This section is divided into two major midways, which flank either side of a massive fountain display. Lining these midways are a large selection of restaurants, gift shops, and otherwise very stylized buildings. There are four groups of buildings divided by the pathways to other areas in the park. Each of these groups have their own architectural style based on different regions. On the left side are the Latin American and Mediterranean buildings, and on the right are the Alpine and Scandinavian buildings. Although this area of the park doesn't have any attractions, it's still the most iconic section of the park, and is where every Wonderland adventure starts and ends. Standing at the end of International Street is the iconic Wonder Mountain, where each side of it welcomed guests into the next area of the park, International Festival. Encircling Wonder Mountain, International Festival is often the section of the park that gets the least discussion. However, it's an area that most people in the park walk through every visit. At opening, this section of the park only housed three rides. A bumper car attraction named Krakenwagen, a Huss swing around named Clockworks, and the first of the park's coasters, Blora and Zian. Blora and Zian may be a name that's not too familiar to most park goers, as it's more commonly known as the name it has today, Thunder Run. For the first five years of the park's opening, Blora and Zian was located outside an international festival. However, in 1986, the coaster was relocated to the inside of Wonder Mountain, where it still resides to this day. Step on board, new Thunder Run! Participating McDonald's restaurants now for your Canada's Wonderland coupon to save four dollars off the regular passport. Thunder Run is a mock rides power coaster which uses electric motors to propel the train as opposed to a traditional lift hill or launch track. Riders wind around the inside of Wonder Mountain, making two passes around the track. International Festival loosely continues on the Alpine theming of the fourth set of buildings on International Street. On the right side of International Festival is the back entrance to the most iconic land of Canada's Wonderland, Medieval Fair. Ever since the park's opening, it's been clear why Medieval Fair has consistently been one of, if not the most popular area of the park. Out of all the original sections, it's the one that had some of the best theming. Just like its name implies, Medieval Fair is themed to Medieval Europe. At opening, this section of the park had two of the park's roller coasters. Wild Beast is a wooden roller coaster that was based on Wildcat at Coney Island in Cincinnati, the park that Kings Island was a revitalization of. Additionally, Dragonfire was also located here. This aerodynamics looping coaster featured four inversions, two vertical loops, and two corkscrews. Opening the same year as the now defunct Super Menage at La Ronde in Montreal, it was the first inverting roller coaster in Canada. 
Medieval Fair also opened with three flat rides, all of which are still in operation today. A teacups ride named Spinnovator, a swinging ship named Viking's Rage, and a UFO named Wild Nightmares. Outside of just rides, the area originally also had a lot of live entertainment and walk-around characters. However, those have been phased out of this area over the decades. There was another entertainment venue though, that being Canterbury Theatre right at the main entrance of the area. This theatre is home to many stage shows, including a 45-minute salute to Hollywood in the opening year named Those Magnificent Movies. Medieval Fair has continued to stay one of the most popular areas and well-themed areas in the park, but even at opening, there was one area that was better themed. Across the Rainbow Bridge was the entrance to Wonderland's most interesting area, the Happy Land of Hanna-Barbera. Hanna-Barbera Land was definitely the most in-depth of all the areas at Canada's Wonderland at opening. This area was split into three smaller sections, each themed to a different IP from Hanna-Barbera. The center of the area was Scoobyville, obviously themed to Scooby-Doo. This section featured a lot of pretty buildings, as well as a central carousel, and the fourth of the fifth original coasters, Scooby's Gasping Ghoster Coaster. This was an exact clone of a roller coaster model located at all three of the other Taft parks. On the side of Scoobyville was Bedrock, the area themed to the Flintstones. This section housed a few more kids' rides, as well as the Bedrock Aquarium, originally named Saltwater Circus. This was a dolphin and sea lion show that was performed at a venue in Bedrock. In 1993, dolphins were removed from the show, leaving it with only sea lions and seals. This was a very popular attraction at the time, and is where a lot of people's fondest memories of the park come from. Finally, to the south of Scoobyville was Yogi's Woods, themed to the Yogi Bear Show. This section wasn't as large, but it still featured a few rides and a live show hosted by Yogi Bear at Woodland Theatre. The Happy Land of Hanna-Barbera was by far the most extensive land in the park, and arguably the best themed. However, the final land of the park put up some fair competition in this category. Right off the left of International Street, guests are invited to visit the Grand World Exposition of 1890. <laughs> The final area of the park was the largest by both area and attraction size when Wonderland first opened. The Grand World Exposition of 1890 was themed to a World's Fair that would have taken place in 1890. Because of this, the area has buildings and rides themed to many different places around the world. There were buildings themed to Japan, Persia, Morocco, China, the Netherlands, Mexico, and more. This area also included the most popular opening attractions at the park. Firstly is the very historic carousel of this area. This carousel was one of the original 87 Philadelphia Toboggan Company carousels, of which there are only 29 still in operation. There was also Swing of Siam, a chair swing that was later relocated to Crystal Palace, the arcade from this section. Right at the front of this section was Zumba Flume, one of the most iconic defunct attractions of Canada's Wonderland. This log flume had two tracks, each of which had a steep 40-foot drop. Grand World Exposition also had two rides similar to Wild Nightmares, but they both had a twist to them. There was Pharaoh's Eye, which had a different setup for the rider's position, and there was Sol Loco, which riders sat down on. The latter of these was eventually changed to be named Orbiter, the name it remained as until its removal in 2018. Finally for the major attractions was the park's fifth and final opening year coaster, Mighty Canadian Mindbuster. Unlike Wild Beast, which is more of a twister layout, Mindbuster was a more traditional out-and-back coaster, featuring many airtime hills and a spiraling helix finale. Grand World Exposition was the most expansive area of the park, and it, alongside all the other areas I've mentioned, made up the original Canada's Wonderland. You may realize that I didn't mention one of the propositions that Taft had. That's because Frontier Canada was never actually built for the opening of the park. Yes, the area that sold the opposition of the park was the one that was never actually built. But even with that dropped promise, the park still did incredibly well. Enough so that Canada's Wonderland began to expand. Over the next few years, Canada's Wonderland would begin to shape itself into the mega park that it is today. And where does this all begin? With a small plot of land just west of Mindbuster. I'm king of the mountain.
Following the great success of their opening year, Taft was able to fully value the success of Canada's Wonderland and began funding new attractions to increase its success. Between 1982 and 1984, some changes and additions to the park happened. The park added an Intamin River Rapids named Whitewater Canyon, and Yogi's Woods was rethemed to Smurf Village. However, in 1985, the park kicked it up a notch with their first new coaster since the park's opening, as well as Canada's first stand-up roller coaster. Step in and stand by for the ride of your life. But don't sit down, cause there ain't no seats. There ain't no seats. Can you stand it? You can't sit down. Where's the seats? Ride the new Skyrider, Canada's first stand-up coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Skyrider was located near the back of the park, close to Mindbuster. Unlike a traditional roller coaster, riders on Skyriders rode the coaster while standing up, providing a much different experience that most would consider uncomfortable. That didn't mean that Skyrider wasn't popular, though. The nearest similar ride at the time it opened was its sister ride, King Cobra at King's Island, which opened a year prior. The year after this, Bloor Enzian was relocated to the inside of Wonder Mountain and became Thunder Run. 1987 saw the debut of the park's seventh coaster, the Bat. Welcome to Canada's Wonderland, where our new ride's going to tie you in knots. First, we'll give you one quick twist. Ooh, one more. And then, hello! If you think that was scary, now you have to do it all over again! Backwards! Oh! A bat! Only at Canada's Wonderland! Because Wonderland's the one! Oh! The Bat is a Vacoma Boomerang Coaster, a ride which sends riders both forwards and backwards through three inversions. This was another popular attraction at the time. The next three years saw smaller editions of flat rides and water rides. However, 1991 would see the biggest coaster yet for Canada's Wonderland. The most awesome roller coaster ever is now at Canada's Wonderland. But there's one thing missing. The track. Quarter City. Heard of with 90 kilometers an hour with nothing to make you work in. And confront the power of motion as you plunge into chaos. Now feel the grip of vortex. Ooh. And Canada's Wonderland. Hurry, get valuable coupons now at A&P or Dominion to save $4 off each regular passport, plus get a free M&M's yo-yo and other great deals at the park. Vortex takes riders up 98 feet onto the top of Wonder Mountain. After diving off the side of Wonder Mountain, it swings riders around rapidly across the back river of the park. Vortex is the tallest and fastest coaster of its type. Unlike traditional roller coasters, Vortex is a suspended coaster. These have the trains sitting below the track, giving an experience that makes the ground feel a lot closer. To add on to this sensation, Vortex also has cars that freely swing, which makes every ride unique in its own way. Vortex made its debut with great public response, and it instantly became a smash hit addition at the park. In the 1980s, Kecko built up a very strong start for Canada's Wonderland, finishing with Vortex in 1991, However, the rest of the 1990s would see a very different Canada's Wonderland. This is how legends are made. In 1993, the media company Paramount Pictures acquired all five of the Taft Broadcasting Parks, turning them into their new division, Paramount Parks. All five of the major parks, Kings Island, Kings Dominion, Carowinds, California's Great America, and Canada's Wonderland, were all given new names with Paramount added before the parks' names. This was a very significant change for the parks. Most significantly for Canada's Wonderland, was the new water park that the park introduced in 1992, Splashworks. Splashworks cost around 6 million Canadian to build in 1992. Spanning 10 acres, Splashworks opened with many water slides, a lazy river, and a kid's play area. 
Four years later, Splashworks doubled its size, including new bridges over Mindbuster. This addition also featured the largest outdoor wave pool in Canada, Whitewater Bay. Secondly, the Paramount era would be the beginning of large-scale ride removals at Canada's Wonderland. Because the park is so landlocked, finding space for new attractions is very difficult, and so some rides had to be retired for new experiences. One of the hardest hits of these was Zumba Flume, which was closed and torn down at the end of 1994. However, it wasn't all bad news for Wonderland under this new ownership. With the introduction of Paramount, many rides were able to tap into the large amount of intellectual properties that Paramount owns, creating new experiences now loosely themed to movies. Hearing that concept, many people would think of attractions like those at the Disney or Universal parks. However, this was far from the case with Paramount's new rides. Take for example the first new Wonderland coaster after this acquisition, Top Gun. What's it like to ride the sky? You saw it in Top Gun, the movie. Now you can do it at Paramount Canada's Wonderland on a wild new jet coaster that shatters the thrill barrier. Ride upside down on the outside track on Top Gun, now flying at Paramount Canada's Wonderland, where the magic of the movie meets the thrills of a lifetime. Get season pass tickets to the adrenaline rush of the summer at the park or Ticketmaster. Get them park open Sunday, May 7th. This coaster was themed after the 1986 movie starring Tom Cruise. Initially, the park planned to construct a Bulliger and Mabyard inverted coaster, where riders are seated underneath the track, traversing through many moments of high g-forces. However, the immensely popular Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio, had a contract with B&M where there could be no B&M inverts within a 200-mile radius of a Cedar Fair park. Unfortunately, Canada's Wonderland was 198 miles from Cedar Point, and so they couldn't construct this planned inverted coaster. Luckily, Dutch manufacturer Vekoma stepped up with their clonable suspended looping coaster, or SLC model. This model was similar to the B&M invert, as riders are seated in the same position and also experience similar g-forces. Paramount decided to construct one of these for the section that Zumba Flume used to reside in. Top Gun opened in 1995 as Canada's Wonderland's ninth roller coaster. What they didn't take into account, however, was the quality of the ride that they were buying. Unlike Bulliger and Mabillard inverted coasters, which are usually very smooth and comfortable rides, Vekoma's SLCs are the roller coaster equivalent of a paint mixer. Most are very rough and uncomfortable rides, but Top Gun is generally considered one of the absolute worst, having some of the most headbanging of any of the SLCs. Regardless, some sadists may still want to ride this coaster, and the ride still does draw on knowing guests into its clutches. No! Oh, that hurts so much! Luckily, the next few years would be more favorable for Canada's Wonderland. In 1997, the park added Drop Zone Stunt Tower and Speed City Raceway to the Medieval Fair section. Oddly modern looking attractions for a medieval section, but hey, that's Paramount Parks for ya. The year afterwards, though, would see a large change to half of the kids' area. Five years prior, Smurf Village had been turned into Kids' Kingdom. However, this new transformation into the new land Kidsville introduced five new rides, including the park's 10th roller coaster, Taxi Jam. Only one year later, the park added their 11th roller coaster, The Fly. Located in International Festival, The Fly is a wild mouse coaster that features many tight elements, with its signature feature being a series of sharp hairpin turns with little banking. At the turn of the millennium, Canada's Wonderland added Riptide, another oddly modern flat ride in Medieval Fair, along with Scooby-Doo's Haunted Mansion, a shooting dark ride. This year also saw the removal of Bayern Curve and the relocation of Clockworks to make way for 2001's edition, Shockwave. Shockwave spins riders on an angle while the seat chassis are spun around like wild. 2001 also saw the addition of the park's 12th roller coaster, Silver Streak. This family inverted coaster was also added to Kings Island and Carowinds and sees riders winding around helixes at slower speeds. In 2002, the upper section of Grand World Exposition was split, introducing the new land of Action Zone, along with another big flat ride, this time being the pendulum ride Cyclone. 2003 saw the transformation of Bedrock. Due to the waning popularity of the Flintstones, Paramount decided to remodel the area and turn it into the new Nickelodeon Central. New rides were added, and some existing ones were rethemed from the Flintstones into Nickelodeon IPs such as Rugrats. 
This year also saw the debut of another Action Zone ride, this time being the one-of-a-kind Sledgehammer. To this day, it is still the only one like it on the planet, but that may be for a reason. Although the ride experience of Sledgehammer is very fun and many's favorite flat ride in the park, since the 2010s, the ride has suffered from serious mechanical problems, making it so that the ride goes down every few hours, sometimes within even 20 minutes of getting it operational again. Sledgehammer spins riders on six different claws before rising off the ground and spinning up in the air. The ride lifts and drops riders a few more times, including some where the claws rotate up and are nearly vertical. Paramount was on a mad addition spree in the 2000s, and that included 2004, where Canada's Wonderland was introduced to their 13th roller coaster, Tomb Raider The Ride. As the name suggests, this coaster was themed to the 2003 film Laura Croft's Tomb Raider The Cradle of Life. That film itself is based off of the video game series Tomb Raider, so it's a coaster themed to a movie based off of a game, instead of just being based off the game itself. Tomb Raider the Ride would be the last addition to the Grand World Exposition section of the park. The ride sees riders awkwardly climb into four cross strains in a standing position before being locked in and tilted down into an uncomfortable lying position. Tomb Raider the Ride has an interesting spiral lift hill as opposed to a regular chain lift. This provides a nice 360 degree view of the park, giving riders a good feeling before realizing they're about to ride Tomb Raider the Ride. After dipping down the one somewhat comfortable drop, Riders are flung around sharp and painful hairpin turns, janky as can be inline twists, and even more uncomfortable dips. Riders return to the station, where they're tilted up into the standing position again. After stumbling off the constantly moving trains, riders exit through the back of the station, wondering to themselves why they decided to ride this coaster when there are so many better rides all across the park. Oh, that was crunchy. <laughs> that was a very rough experience today. 2005 was a big transition year for the amusement industry. Six Flags Great Adventure was debuting the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster, King Ka. Disneyland was celebrating their 50th anniversary, and the coaster manufacturer The Gravity Group were getting their start with Hades at Mount Olympus. This year also saw a new coaster come to all three of the original Paramount Parks, including Canada's Wonderland. That coaster being Italian Jobs Stunt Track. Italian Job's stunt track was themed to the 2003 film The Italian Job, another movie-themed attraction from Paramount. This coaster was, and still is, Canada's Wonderland's only launched coaster, featuring a magnetic launch that propels riders to 40 miles per hour in only 3 seconds. Riders aboard the Mini Cooper-designed trains traverse an upward helix, several low-to-the-ground turns, a second launch, and an indoor winding section. The ride also included special effects throughout, the signature one being at the mid-course break run, where a helicopter shot simulated gunfire and barrels burst into flames. This coaster was by far the best themed at Canada's Wonderland, and it seemed like Paramount was beginning to find their footing and get situated in their slot in the amusement industry. However, next year, quite the opposite would happen. Between 2005 and 2006, quite possibly the most significant acquisition in the history of the amusement industry would happen. In early 2006, CBS announced that they would be selling all six of the amusement parks in their Paramount Parks chain. Prior to this, the chain was suffering a bit, especially after the mechanical nightmare Son of Beast at Kings Island. The parks were put up for bid, and the winner would be none other than Cedar Fair, Paramount's prime rival in regional amusement entertainment. Cedar Fair had owned and operated six parks before this acquisition, including the coaster capital of the world, Cedar Point. They seem the most fitting for the ownership of these parks, and let's just say that after Cedar Fair, Canada's Wonderland would never be the same. After the acquisition, Canada's Wonderland began to evolve. A lot of the IPs in the park from the Paramount era began to fade away. Italian Job's stunt track became Backlot Stunt Coaster. Top Gun became Flight Deck. Tomb Raider the Ride became Time Warp, and most significantly, Nickelodeon Central and Scoobyville merged and morphed into Planet Snoopy. This new area opened in 2010, incorporated theming and characters from the Peanuts. Planet Snoopy felt a lot closer to the original view of the Happy Land of Hanna-Barbera. These changes brought the park to feel a lot more like the other parks in the Cedar Fair chain, especially their flagship park, Cedar Point. And, also like Cedar Point, Canada's Wonderland was about to enter a new age of thrills. 
Cedar Fair brought not just Canada's Wonderland into a new age, but all of the parks they purchased from Paramount Parks. The thing Cedar Fair is known for is their show-stopping thrill coasters, and the first for their new acquisitions came to Wonderland in 2008. At the time, it was the tallest and fastest roller coaster in all of Canada. Big, bold, behemoth. Instead of the world ending in 2012, Canada was welcome to a new beginning. The tallest, longest, and fastest roller coaster in the country. Arms up, voices loud, and get ready for Leviathan. After Leviathan, Canada's Wonderland took a bit of a break from massive additions. In 2014, they would debut Wonder Mountain's Guardian. This start coaster goes into Wonder Mountain and features many projection screens. Five years after Wonder Mountain's Guardian, Canada's Wonderland opened a truly dominating new attraction. The tallest, longest, and fastest vertical dive coaster on the planet. Strap yourselves in and welcome to Yukon Striker. Turn it up! Let's just see how high we can go Turn it up No stop until we lose our control Turn it up Until we feel it down in our soul Cedar Fair was really able to transform Canada's Wonderland into the icon of the Great White North that it is now. In only 15 years, they have added three of the largest roller coasters in the world. Behemoth was the first coaster Cedar Fair built for Canada's Wonderland, as well as the first major addition to one of their newly acquired Paramount Parks. Behemoth stands proudly over the southern region of the park at a height of 230 feet. Riders on Behemoth speed faster than 70 miles per hour, and experience many camelback hills that provide a great feeling of weightlessness or airtime. The ride finishes with a 270 degree spiraling helix and a few more airtime hills. When riders walk off Behemoth, they're able to purchase an on-ride photo that is taken at the bottom of the final helix. Leviathan was the first giga coaster constructed by Swiss manufacturer Bulliger and Maviard, who had become ingrained in the ex-Paramount Parks with coasters like Diamondback at Kings Island, Dominator at Kings Dominion, and Intimidator at Carowinds, as well as the aforementioned Behemoth. A Giga Coaster is a classification for roller coasters that have a height or drop taller than 300 feet, but shorter than 400 feet. Bulliger and Mabyard would go on to construct two more Giga Coasters, Fury 325 in 2015 at Carowinds, which quickly became one of the most loved roller coasters in the world, and finally, Orion would also be constructed by them in 2020 at Kings Island. To this day, Leviathan is still by far the tallest, longest, and fastest roller coaster in all of Canada, as well as the most popular in the entire park. Leviathan features a 306 foot drop and crushes highway speed limits at an incredible top speed of 92 miles per hour, 
or 148 kilometers per hour. After falling more than 300 feet, riders are thrown into a tunnel meant to represent the Leviathan. Unlike Behemoth, Leviathan has a lot more lateral movements and lower elements. These elements show off the speed of Leviathan, as well as also giving great sensations of airtime. Leviathan traverses its way around the front of the park. Being the very first thing guests see as they approach the entrance, it's able to be a very foreboding coaster and provides a great way to hype up guests for a fun day of riding. Once again, riders are able to purchase an on-ride photo, this one being taken right after the first turn. There's also the one-of-a-kind Wonder Mountain's Guardian. This was the first major coaster to be built by the German company Art Engineering. Art Engineering partnered with the Montreal Dark Ride manufacturer Triotech to create a new type of roller coaster, the world's first and only dark coaster. Wonder Mountain's Guardian combines the regular thrills of a roller coaster with the storytelling mechanics of a dark ride, including each rider being equipped with a laser gun to shoot enemies on projection screens. The coaster debuted in 2014 and typically draws a large crowd due to its novelty and interactiveness. Yukon Striker was the most recent roller coaster that Canada's Wonderland has added. Yukon Striker is the only roller coaster in Canada with a 90 degree vertical drop, as well as being the second tallest in Canada. Three years before Yukon Striker, Cedar Fair tested the waters of a dive coaster with Valraven at Cedar Point. This coaster was the tallest, longest, and fastest dive coaster at the time. However, Yukon Striker took all of these records when it debuted. Yukon Striker also features a unique conveyor belt system for their loose articles. This system is one of a kind on Yukon Striker, and it cuts down on the time it takes to load and unload trains significantly. Standing 245 feet tall, riders on Yukon Striker surpass 80 miles per hour. The coaster provides a floating sensation through both its inversions and the iconic holding drop. Out of all the coasters at Canada's Wonderland, it's the one that feels closest to flying, especially on one of the edge seats. Just like the other two major coasters, Yukon Striker also features on-ride photos, these being taken right before the final helix. Outside of just the coasters the park added from 2008 to 2019, Cedar Fair made many other additions to the park. In 2011, they introduced their first flat ride since acquisition, that being the world's first Windseeker ride. Windseeker is an attraction built by Mondial. It sees riders traverse a 301 foot tall tower, making it the second tallest ride in the park, just 5 feet shorter than Leviathan. Riders are seated in suspended chairs two across with their feet dangling. As the gondola climbs the tower, it spins, providing the best view from any attraction at Wonderland. This ride provides both a great sensation of swinging so high, but also an unnerving feeling that can make the legs wobbly of even the most seasoned thrill junkies. The same year as Leviathan, Canada's Wonderland also introduced the very controversial Fastlane and Fastlane Plus systems of the Cedar Fair chain. This is a system where guests are able to wait in a reduced queue for certain attractions at an upcharged cost. Oftentimes, the queue for Fastlane never exceeds 10 or 15 minutes, a far cry from the regular queues at Canada's Wonderland, which often exceed one hour on popular attractions. The standard Fastlane costs around $60 and grants access to these attractions. However, in order to access the park's big three rides, a Fastlane Plus is required, which costs around $80. Additionally, season pass holders can purchase a Fastlane Plus add-on to their season passes, which grants them Fastlane Plus access for the entire season for the very reasonable price of only $500, or the equivalent of nearly six times the price of a season pass. 2012 also saw the introduction of Dinosaurs Alive. This area was a walk-around attraction that was located near the back of the park in Planet Snoopy. Dinosaurs Alive featured 29 animatronic dinosaurs, including Baryonyx, Spinosaurus, Triceratops, and of course, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Dinosaurs Alive was an upcharge attraction, costing $6 for entry. The area was supposed to immerse guests and transport them back in time to the prehistoric. Having the majority of this area right in full view of Leviathan definitely didn't disturb that setting the attraction was intended to have. Regardless, Dinosaurs Alive was a popular attraction, lasting six years at the park, all the way until 2018. 2013 didn't see any major new attractions, but it did include the very first visit to the park of yours truly. I was just a little guy when I first went, only nine years old, but man, that trip was really what started my love for amusement parks. In 2014, right as Wonder Mountain's Guardian was being introduced, the park faced its first and only roller coaster removal. At the end of the season, Skyrider was removed from the park, with its last day being Labor Day of 2014. 
The plot remained empty for years before eventually being filled in with Yukon Striker, a very worthy replacement. Skyrider still lives on, however, and it was relocated to a park in Tuscany, Italy, where it remains operating as Freestyle. The year after Wonder Mountain's Guardian, 2015, Canada's Wonderland introduced Slingshot. This ride tosses two riders into the sky, flinging them up multiple times and spinning them all around. Because this ride has such a small capacity, it makes sense that it's an upcharge attraction. For only- What?! Okay, so for only $25, two people can- Wait, what's that? It's 25 per person? So, 50 in total. The hell? Isn't that like the price of a standard day ticket? Okay then! Uh, right, this attraction was pretty popular, and it was also introduced alongside a new Splashworks expansion as well. 2016 saw the debut of two more flat rides, those being Skyhawk and Flying Eagles. Skyhawk sees riders take to the skies. Each being able to control their wings, riders are taken up and spun around in a similar fashion to Windseeker. However, if they tilt their wings just right, riders can begin freely rotating around like a clock. If done successfully, they can even perform a full 360 degree rotation. Some take this to the extreme, being able to pull off upwards of 20 or even 30 flips throughout their ride's duration. Another 2016 ride with interactivity, Flying Eagles sees a very similar concept, but to a smaller scale more designed for children and families. This ride only has one rudder, this time being located in the center of the cars. Two across riders are able to enjoy either just the peaceful twirl around, or hone their skills and begin swinging back and forth a lot. Even though this ride looks like it's just a mild family attraction, if pulled off successfully, it can be one of the most fun flat rides in the park. Cedar Fair kept the flat rides rolling with 2017 and the debut of Soaring Timbers. This ride was the first of its kind in North America. Spinning a large capacity of riders all around, Soaring Timbers is one of the most disorienting rides in the park, and often one of the more overlooked. 2017 also saw Canada's first capsule slide complex with Muskoka Plunge in Splashworks. Unlike a traditional water slide, where riders start off by pushing themselves down in a seated position, guests on Muskoka Plunge begin in a standing position. An attendant then locks them into their capsule before giving a countdown. 3, 2, 1. Immediately afterwards, the floor drops beneath the rider, plunging them down the very exhilarating ride. 2018 marked the end of the flat ride train, with the park's final major flat ride, Lumberjack. This ride is similar to a traditional swinging ship like Viking's Rage, however, there are two sides to it, and both of them perform full 360 degree rotations. Lumberjack is located in an area where it doesn't attract many guests, but the ones who do ride it know that this is one of the most exciting flat rides at Canada's Wonderland. This ride also segues nicely into 2019's major revitalization of the back of the park. With the addition of Yukon Striker, one of the park's original promises would finally be fulfilled, 38 years after the park opened. After all this time of waiting, Canada's Wonderland finally added their area theme to the culture and heritage of Canada. In 2019, Frontier Canada was finally brought to light. This area absorbed parts of International Festival and Kidsville, including Flying Canoes, Lumberjack, Mindbuster, Soaring Timbers, Timberwolf Falls, Whitewater Canyon, and Vortex. Themed to the Klondike Gold Rush, Frontier Canada includes very classical western architecture, as well as a feel unlike anywhere else in the park. The area also hosted an event around Canada Day named Celebration Canada in 2019. This event filled the park with more street entertainers, live music, fireworks, and a massive food festival in the centre of Frontier Canada. Unfortunately, this event could not run in 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, However, it is expected that the celebration will make a return at some point in the future. Finally in 2019, the chain added Canada's Wonderland to their list of parks that celebrate Winterfest. During November and December, Canada's Wonderland gets a makeover to turn it into a winter wonderland. From 3pm to 9pm, guests are able to explore select areas of the park and see them in a new wintry style. Several rides also run during this time, including Thunder Run, Vikings Fury, Clockworks, and more. Winterfest's main event, however, is their ice skating. The famous Fountain Plaza on International Street is turned into an ice skating rink during Winterfest. Guests are able to rent skates and enjoy skating around the front of the park. Winterfest was a massive success in its debut year of 2019, and continues into the 2021 season and beyond. Winterfest was the last time that Canada's Wonderland was able to operate normally again. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Canada's Wonderland was not able to open for the 2020 season. 
Plans were made and preparations were set up during the summer. However, the park remained closed. Canada's Wonderland did return in 2021, though. Under new guidelines and protocols, the park was able to reopen in a mostly complete state. 2021 also saw the carryover attractions that were meant for 2020, those being Beagle Brigade Airfield, a new fun kitty ride located in Planet Snoopy, and Mountain Bay Cliffs, a multi-level diving platform in Splashworks, with the tallest cliff being 7.5 meters tall. The future is uncertain for Canada's Wonderland as Canada begins to revise its provisions again, but that doesn't mean the park is doomed. Throughout the 40 years of its existence, Canada's Wonderland went from Taft's little dream to one of the largest amusement parks in the world. Home to 17 roller coasters, 11 water slides, and a total of 70 attractions in all, it's no wonder why Canada's Wonderland is the most visited seasonal amusement park in all of North America. 41 years after first being welcomed into the world, who knows what the future of Wonderland will hold? All I know is that I don't want flight deck there. <laughs>